Thank you, Pat. Peter, it's great to be here. We're gonna have a little bit of fun because I like this topic and we're still in the data phase. So I don't get to report praise or depressing data just yet. My disclosures uh, are relevant for Novadec Honorarium Consultant. So let's just get right to it. So you've completed your low anterior resection, you're doing your intraluminal assessment of your proximal and distal mucosa, you happen to have a near infrared device in the OR, and this is what you see. So this is using a rigid uh, proctoscope and placing a near infrared camera through the rigid proctoscope. So the pneumo in my impression isn't as good as an endoscopic evaluation, so I still do both because I really like a real strong air leak evaluation, but you can see that the rectal area is perfusing before the colon. Most of us would say that's reversed. So what's going on here? Any ideas? Thankfully, this one's salvageable. That's, that'll give you a hint. And then all of a sudden, we see a little bit of a later perfusion in that proximal colon. So it turns out I had a great occlusive person holding my colon closed beforehand, so great that they were actually interfering with the mucosal perfusion. So as soon as we relaxed on that, whew, I got to take a deep breath in. This is just showing um, the, uh, the near infrared view. So I remember very distinctly as an intern asking my first mentor in colorectal surgery, Sir Jacques Capel, French Canadian surgeon, what is the difference between an anterior section and a low anterior section? And, and he very astutely said, hmm, the number of times I cursed during the case. Um, and that's my horrible rendition of his response, but um, I still haven't come up with a much better explanation for my uh, residents as well. So perhaps the title of this uh, talk should be Strategies for Minimizing the F-bomb Factor During a Low Pelvic Anastomosis. So let's just get to your perfusion assessment. Uh, so this is uh, from an extremely well-known institution sitting here to my left. They looked at left-sided anastomosis, just shy of 1,000 cases. About 83% uh, of the cases, a leak test was performed. Um, there was a positive air leak in 8% of those cases, an overall clinical leak rate of five. When they looked at the cases specifically that um, underwent air leak testing, if the leak was, air leak was positive, the leak rate was just shy of 8%, negative 4%, just shy of no leak. Our uh, test was performed, uh, the leak rate for that group was 8.1. When they looked at what was done for the findings of the leak air testing, uh, they found that repairing the anastomosis had an even worse outcome, 12.2%, uh, and in patients who are diverted, and also in patients where the anastomosis was redone, the leak rate dropped down to perfect. So what are we doing today to evaluate our anastomosis? Nothing, hoping for the best, crossing our fingers and toes, saying our prayers at night, uh, bulb syringe, rigid proctoscope, um, and, and specifically, are, is an air leak test sufficient, um, especially in 2016? Why should we um, instead look directly with our endoscopes in the OR? We talked about earlier that most of us have VO2 colonoscopes in the OR, and I think largely because of this reason, we even know that we can see better and intervene if there's any findings of bleeding um, with an endoscope in the OR. So it's more than just an air leak test. You're really looking at that proximal and distal perfusion above and below your staple line. And you really need to be critical, um, not prayerful about the information that you find. Uh, so is there a way to grade this perfusion? Uh, and, and in fact, our colleagues at UC Irvine um, have come up with such a grading system. So this is you know, home run. This is what you wanna see every single time. Great perfusion, proximal, distal. This starts to make you think, well, it's probably gonna be okay. Uh, but technically, uh, you'll see in the data that that probably isn't the case most of the time. And again, these are assuming intact donuts and negative air leak tests for this grading system. And then grade three, you can see there's some real problems with this anastomosis, and this really ought to be redone. So when they looked at the first 75 cases when they started uh, doing uh, this endoscopic evaluation and tracking of consecutive cases, you can see the variety of cases here. Uh, for that perfect dream home run anastomosis endoscopically, uh, there still were seven leaks, 12%. The grade two, well, that probably is gonna be okay. Guess what? Even though the numbers are extremely small, 50% leak rate in that area. Grade three anastomosis, all of them were taken down to grade one anastomosis and no su subsequent leaks. So again, small numbers, but starts to get us, us potentially thinking differently about how we're gonna approach this. So if it looks perfect on high definition endoscopy, the overall leak rate was 4%. 
If it was mildly ischemic, the leak rate popped up to 25%. So despite this, leaks still occur. So is there anything else that we can do besides white light endoscopic evaluation? So this was some of the uh, near-infrared uh, imaging uh, just an initial 40 to 50 patients then compared to the data and literature as far as leak rates. So we get a first spy into how potentially near-infrared imaging with fluorescent angiography may even be better than our naked eye. And then robotically, the technology is there, there as well. You can see this is after you've mobilized your rectum, you're, you're, mar you're marching out what your proximal transection point is going to be, and you can see the fluorescent angiography is going to tell you you're on or off and by how many centimeters. And then again, this is a, a relatively small, but the initial robotic data, you can see the revision and transection point was significantly different in the near infrared in the cyan and green group compared to the control, and also the leak rate. Uh, one patient versus four patient, and again, small numbers. So let's get to a little bit uh, larger numbers. So this technology is also available laparoscopically. Uh, and you can see the various modes and it overlays those modes so that your eyes can see the brilliant green like in the first video. And my first aha moment when I started using the near infrared imaging is that it's really a line in the sand. I used to think it was this scalloped border or maybe areas of great perfusion and poor perfusion, but it's literally, you can draw a line across the colon don't need to flail back on that anti-mesenteric side like we talked about um, during my training. So the first uh, trial is non-randomized, but uh, multi-center. And it took uh, just a proof of concept. Is it feasible? What are the results? What is the leak rate in a multi-center uh, fashion? And we really just looked at the change plan location of resection. Did that impact the change using the near infrared imaging? Did we revise the anastomosis based on the findings? And did you divert or not divert based on your findings? And was that different compared to what your preoperative plan was? So 139 patients, again, we'll go quickly. You, you see that change to resection margin uh, in nine patients are about just shy of 7%. And then the leak rate fairly low, uh, 2%. And the abscess, obviously, in the same two patients. And interestingly, if you add that 7% change to the proximal uh, resection to uh, the anastomotic leak rate, we start to see uh, we're popping back into that 10% leak rate range of what's reported in the literature. So to follow that up, we're uh, in the middle of the Pillar 3 trial led by uh, Mike Stamos and Steve Wexner using uh, the laparoscopic camera to evaluate your perfusion, but you can actually perform the surgery open robotic laparoscopically transamal total mesorectal excision. It's your choice. The anastomosis has to be anywhere from 10 centimeters from the anus to the anus. You just have to actually make an anastomosis for the trial. So here's the information here. I think we're going to have some great data because you actually have to scope the patient if they're diverted as your postoperative follow-up. And I found a couple of my patients already um, subclinical leaks or asymptomatic leaks where I otherwise wouldn't have actually found a leak because I wouldn't have looked. So I think uh, regardless of whether the near infrared um, is impactful, we're going to see a, a, a significant um, number of data, I think, from the study. So when do we redo the anastomosis? So obviously technical errors. When I decided to become a colorectal surgeon, my mentor as a vascular surgeon told me, Lisa, you know, stool doesn't clot. Are you sure you want to be a colorectal surgeon? Um, obviously inadequate or poor perfusion. And my game plan actually before reviewing the data was that I got one chance to fix it, a leak, if found during the operation. Um, and usually that's fixing it with suture, which isn't very good. If I didn't fix it, um, I either re redid the anastomosis or I diverted or both. So let's look again at the Leahy data, specifically the leaks that were repaired. So my game plan actually makes the leak worse. So 12.2% instead of 8%. And again, let's look at uh, the UCI data. Although these are small numbers, uh, again, you know, oh, it probably looks okay. It, sh it miss shoulda, coulda, oughta be good a 50% leak rate without a perfect view on endoscopy. So again, that 4% chance, uh, perfect view, and then all the way up to 25% when there's questionable findings. So my revised game plan after seeing all of this data is that technically I still get one chance if there's obviously a stable line defect, suture closure, test again, uh, no good, redo and divert. Um, but if there's suboptimal perfusion, 
now redo the anastomosis, or at least that's my game plan. Thankfully, I haven't had to redo it yet since I changed my game plan, but I'm sure it's in my near, near future. So lastly, let's talk a little, have a little fun and talk about some intraoperative Hail Marys that, that I've had the fortune or disfortune of having to think about and do in the last year. So basically, we all know this area of, is a watershed area, not only for ischemic colitis, with low perfusion states after a AAA, but also after low anterior section. For various reasons, the vasculature may not be sufficient to supply the blood that you need to create a well-perfused anastomosis. So now you're dealing with pretty much the entire rectum gone, your left colon's out, it's dead, it's not resuscitated, it's not coming back, you can't do CPR on this thing. So what are you gonna do? So there's a couple different options that you have. And if you haven't seen this, you've probably thought about it. Uh, but basically, you have to clamp the middle colic and the right colic and make sure that in doing so, you don't have an entirely dead colon. So that's your first test. Um, and in doing so, after you fully mobilize the colon, obviously, the transverse colon hepatic flexure and, and ascending colon, um, you're going to then basically divide the middle colic, the right branch, uh, excuse me, the right colic, and then reverse the colon on itself, remove the appendix. You're going to be actually twisting the IMA pedicle, but as long as you mobilize it up and over the duodenum, that twist is technically over a much longer area and doesn't seem to cause a problem. And then you can perform an ascending colon rectal anastomosis. I've scoped one of these recently. It's the most confusing endoscopic experience that I've ever had, um, but it, it is viable and possible, and, and the patients do have relatively decent function afterwards. If that doesn't seem like it's gonna reach, you can actually create an anti-peristalt. So same mobilization, same appendectomy. Um, this time you're basically anastomosing the cecum to the low pelvic, or to the rectum and the low pelvis, and the terminal ileum you can either replant um, at the end of the colon, which is really the, make sure my anatomy is correctly, either, either the uh, hepatic flexure or if, if reach and twisting seems to be a problem, you can implant it right dead center in the, in the middle of the colon there. And then lastly, not so much for ischemic areas, uh, but sometimes so either the Turnbull QT is, is, an, is a great solution, albeit it's extremely torturous to the patient because they're basically sitting around with a really large tail in the hospital for about a week or uh, sh just shy of a week and a half. It doesn't smell very good after about three or four days. Um, you're worrying the entire time that the whole thing is going to be ischemic. But when you're dealing with a patient with severe Crohn's proctitis, but a beautiful anus, so you actually can preserve the sphincter muscle, um, but they have a rectovaginal fistula and it's just a hot mess in there or there's been other surgeons operating in the pelvis and they've created a hot mess and now it's your turn to fix it. This is a, a great uh, tool to have in your back pocket. So c in conclusion, I think if you're not doing endoscopic evaluation, you ought to, I think most people are. It's more than just an air leak test and I really try to get our residents to document in their operative notes that you wanna document the perfusion of the mucosa, whether you're using white light, near infrared imaging, um, that the perfusion of the mucosa is assessed as well as an air leak test. And then lastly, near infrared fluorescent angiography. I think it's a great tool. I think it actually trains our eyes a bit better to see perfusion and poor perfusion, but we'll see uh, what the randomized trial shows. Thank you for your time.